Welcome everyone to the fourth in our series of seven target antibiotic webinars. I'm Professor Cleana McNulty, Head of Public Health England Primary Care Unit and PHE Lead for the Target Antibiotics Project. Here with me today are Paul Little, Professor of Primary Care Research at Southampton University, who has 20 years experience as a GP and infection related research, including many very large studies evaluating backup antibiotic prescribing. Also, welcome back to Dr. Stephen Granier, a GP in Bristol and the RCGP clinical lead for the Target Antibiotics Project. So, last week we discussed managing patient expectations. This week, Professor Paul Little will present the evidence for so-called backup or delayed antibiotic prescribing and how to use them in your daily practice. While you're watching Paul's presentation, please do note down questions you would like to put to us in the live Q&A that follows. You can do this by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel during or after the video. So let's sit back and watch Paul's presentation. So what am I going to talk about? A brief intro initially about the context and medicalization. Um, talk about the trial evidence, systematic reviews of the trials, the cohort evidence, some of the barriers to use, and then some practical advice about what next. Okay, a bit of context. I won't go through this slide in huge detail, but basically to orientate you, down the left-hand side we have the common things we see, otitis, sore throat, sinusitis, or bronchitis, prior duration, duration after seeing the doctor, total duration untreated, benefit from antibiotics, and the number needed to treat. And just... Um, the precise days aren't that important, but my rule of thumb is quite useful. Half a week, a week, two weeks, and three weeks for these four conditions, and a number needs to treat in all of these cases of an excess of 10. So basically, antibiotics probably don't do terribly much for symptoms for most of the folk we see. But it's a Friday afternoon, you're running late, a young man comes in with his partner and says, I've had antibiotics last year for tonsillitis, and I've got, I've got tonsillitis again, doctor. So do you say no? Um, they're attending because they believe antibiotics caused it to settle last time. So are you in effect medicalizing an illness? Okay, so the question is, how important uh, is medicalizing uh, an illness? Uh, in this case, or acute respiratory illness. Well, the problem is, and here we go, a nice iceberg. Um, most people who have their sore throats or respiratory infections don't bother coming and see, seeing us. If you will contact NHS Direct, We'll probably see about one in 10 and secondary care about one in 3,000. So we can't really afford to bring in the people who I feel like are, are under that iceberg. So what's the place of delayed prescription or backup prescription? Well, the first trial we did, a bit of an old chestnut, uh, we looked at three strategies, no offer of antibiotics, immediate or delayed. And these are the three strategies, if you like, in each of these sets of columns, that's antibiotic, no antibiotic, or delayed, and as you can see, didn't make any difference to, to whether people got better in, in a few days, no difference to people being satisfied with the consultation, but by prescribing you were an immediate antibiotic, you were hugely increasing the belief in antibiotics and increasing intention to consult. And it, when we followed up this cohort for a, a year, there was about a 40% relative increase in reconsultations. So uh, the interesting thing was that although antibiotics medicalized the illness, delayed antibiotics and no antibiotics had about the same effect. So uh, quite interesting finding. So, but basically even one antibiotic was pretty strongly medicalizing, fueling reconsultations, uh, fueling antibiotic use. Okay, the next thing is uh, how does this apply to other studies or is it just a thing that you can use in sore throat? Uh, well, the first next study we did, if you like, was um, otitis media. And as you can see, actually immediate compared to delayed, you did get a, uh, a difference in duration of around a day, but that was at the stage when the illness is, is, is much milder anyway, as is shown by this next slide. So as you can see, level of pain, six out of 10 in the first day, pretty painful illness. The child is unwell, you're up at night with them. But even after another 24 hours, it's down by about a half and it just goes down exponentially. And antibiotics make a, a very slight difference, but really not significant in that time period. So for otitis, not doing terribly much. Chest infections was the next thing. These are uh, these estimates, those, those little dots in the middle of the estimates comparing delayed or antibiotics with no antibiotics. 
And as you can, and these are the confidence intervals. And basically what this shows is for all of these outcomes, cough duration, moderately bad duration or severity, um, we really re weren't doing anything. We've looked at other conditions, related conditions, conjunctivitis, similar story really. Um, no major difference between an immediate uh, prescription of antibiotic drops and a delayed prescription of antibiotic drops. Next very important question is how to do it. In fact, there are related questions. So it's actually pretty easy. It's not rocket science, but it does need to be done properly. And if you do it properly, it will then reduce antibiotic use. So I've, I've called them the six R's, but you know, that's slightly artificial. Um, most of those six R's are simply good practice um, uh, in the NICE guidance. So the first thing is reassurance that um, they don't need antibiotics uh, immediately uh, because they're not likely to get anything horrible happening to them. Um, uh, the second thing is reasons not to use antibiotics. So antibiotics have side effects, um, allergy, um, and the side effect, if you like, of antimicrobial resistance. The third thing is providing good advice about symptom relief, the, the third R. So, and I would advise regular paracetamol in the maximal doses. Um, and in that context, I would say, please don't use non-steroidals or very limited use of non-steroidals. I won't talk about that in great detail, but we showed in, in one of our trials that if you give non-steroidals uh, like ibuprofen, uh, you get longer duration, more severe illness, and people are more likely to come back with either progression of symptoms or, or complications. So I would just stick with paracetamol. So simple advice about paracetamol. And this, this fourth R, which is incredibly important if you're doing a delayed prescription, give people a realistic idea of the natural history. Not only do lots of doctors not know what the average natural history is, but patients certainly don't. So, and I would use my rule of thumb, to be honest, half a week, a week, two weeks, or three weeks, depending on the particular respiratory infection. Um, the fifth R is reinforce the key message that you only want people to use the delayed prescription if they're getting worse or not even starting to settle in the expected average time that you've just talked about. And then finally, you need to give some information about uh, if nasty things start happening, they need to come back and see you, so safety netting. Okay, so that's the first bit, the six R's of how to do it. Um, the second bit of how to do it is that you can give, give a delayed prescription in any number of ways. So you can say, come back and see, see me, or um, give me a, a phone call and I can give a prescription. You can post-state the prescription. So um, for a sore throat, you'd say, I'd, I'd give you a, a post-stated prescription for five days. That's a little bit more constraining. You can ask them to come and collect it, which is probably what we've done in most of our studies. Um, and you have to be a little bit flexible about that. So if you want them to collect it, and that would, on average, turn out to be a Sunday, then you have to be flexible about the kind of advice you give. Or lastly, you can just give it and say, um, uh, very clear advice about when to take it, as I've just described in the previous slide. So if you do those four things, does it make any difference? Well, that's what we did in the PIPS trial, published in the BMJ. And so as you can see, those, those four types of delayed prescribing, recontacting, post-dating, collecting, or patient-led, you just give it. Uh, we looked uh, and we compared it to both to no prescription and also to an immediate antibiotic prescription. Actually, that isn't shown, but results very similar in terms of the symptom severity. Really no significant difference in symptom severity there. Similar duration of illness. Um, in terms of belief in antibiotics, um, uh, really you are doing pretty well with a delayed prescription. Um, quite interesting, though, that even if you don't give an antibiotic, lots of people will still believe in an antibiotic. What happens if you give an antibiotic is that 99% that of people believe that it's helpful. So you're reducing the number who believe each time you don't prescribe. Um, in terms of antibiotic use, yes, yeah, sure, uh, a no prescription will give you the lowest antibiotic use, and about 10% more people will use an antibiotic prescription if you've done a delayed prescription properly, as described. And people are pretty satisfied with a, with a no prescription. I mean, of these various ones, the, the the ones that we've trialled the most in all of our trials is asking people to pop back and collect it. People are pretty satisfied, pretty low antibiotic use, and uh, low, lower beliefs in antibiotics. So that's the one that I would probably concentrate on, but I would be flexible. If you do it properly, it doesn't really matter which of these you do. Uh, you'll get similar-ish results, okay? Um, 
So overall, considering that the, the data on, on symptom control and antibiotic use, a delayed or a backup prescription is certainly effective in reducing antibiotic use if it's done properly, it changes beliefs and behavior, and overall symptom control is, is pretty good. Certainly uh, equivalent to having an immediate antibiotic. Um, the problem about all trial data is um, it's the average effect. So we always want to know, what about my particular patient? Um, so, so really you have to use sort of a, a bit of clinical judgment to target antibiotic use and I think use delayed antibiotics flexibly. Uh, most people do not need an antibiotic. So the question is, you know, who are, who are the people who are, who are most likely to need an antibiotic? So let's uh, 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 look, look at uh, otitis media first. The individual patient data, uh, IPD meta-analysis in the, the Lancet. Uh, the children who are most likely to benefit are those under two, those with pus, or those with bilateral disease, both ears affected. And here you're talking about a number needed to treat of around four to five. Um, I have to remember that, that the benefit that that, that uh, uh, analysis looked at was at days three to seven, actually when symptoms are much milder. So just remember the slides that I showed you about um, otitis media. Most of the really bad stuff, the pain, is in the first 24, 48 hours. So you're, you're, you've got a number needs to treat there of four to five for, for by and large milder symptoms. Uh, we did a trial, uh, from our trial, if you like, we looked at the children who are most likely to benefit and it was those with a higher temperature or vomiting, a number needed to treat of three to five. So the picture here is more floridly unwell children uh, and younger children uh, are likely to benefit a little bit more. Does that mean that they really, all of them have to have an immediate antibiotic? Again, I would use your clinical now. Uh, no, I, I think it's perfectly fine for, for such children to have a delayed antibiotic still. Um, but if, if they've got more florid symptoms and more unwell, then certainly you could even halve the waiting time. So the normal waiting time from 72 hours could be reduced to 36 hours or even 24 hours. So I would, I would clinically use things flexibly, flexibly according to how unwell people are. Um, sinusitis, um, similar type of thing. Uh, another individual patient data meta-analysis in the Lancet. Number needed to treat of 15 for the average patient we see. So you have to treat 15 patients roughly um, for one to benefit in sinusitis. But if you have pus visible in the pharynx, a number needs to treat of around eight. Um, so I think the message from these two, otitis media and sinusitis, is unwell patients still settle. But if you're going to use a delayed prescription, I would, I would possibly shorten the waiting time, halve the waiting time from the averages that we, we discussed earlier. In chest infections, um, there's some nice, uh, uh, simple stratification that you can do clinically, but basically there are uh, six uh, symptoms and signs. Um, as you can see, two on the history, two chest signs, two vital signs. And if you have none of those, six, uh, about 1% will have consolidation on an x-ray. One to two of those, uh, around 5%, one in 20 will have, and most, most uh, people who come to see us are in that category. If you have three or more, uh, 20%. So, um, if I see somebody with three or more of those, I'd be tempted to either have an immediate antibiotic or a delayed antibiotic with a, with a reduced time course. One to two, um, uh, delayed antibiotics uh, are pretty reasonable or ask people to come back, uh, good safety netting. And if they don't have any of those, then um, I certainly wouldn't be prescribing antibiotics. Um, so for chest infections, um, I would use a stratified approach and target the delayed prescription to those who have a middling risk, if you like. Um, so uh, that will be dealt with, as I say, in more detail. But I think uh, we could say probably reasonably that if you, are, if you use better diagnosis and targeting of delayed prescriptions, it's likely to lead to better outcomes. You certainly don't need to use a delayed prescription in everybody. Okay, on to the systematic review now. Cochrane review of delayed prescribing. Is no prescribing actually a better thing to do? Well, uh, there are six studies in that review. Uh, they might have been updated more recently, but uh, so, uh, the, uh, the message won't have changed significantly. And as you can see, uh, immediate lots of people end up using their antibiotics. They may not use all of them and keep some of them at home, but they'll, most of them will start using them anyway. Uh, delayed prescription. Um, around, uh, they found around 28 to 30 uh, percent will use their antibiotic. And certainly the most recent study that we did, the PIP study, 
yeah, just over 30%, I would say, uh, early to mid middle 30s will use them, which is fine. Um, yeah, if we could get all antibiotic use down to 30%, we'd be doing well. And in that, the Cochrane systematic use, 4%. Uh, from our recent study, I would say that that's, uh, that's on the low side. In, in the PIPS trial, it was in the mid-20s. So um, from our experience, there's around a 10 to 15% difference in the number of people who will end up using uh, an antibiotic um, if you use delayed prescription properly. The problem about the systematic review of delayed prescriptions done by Cochrane is that um, the, the number of studies is relatively few and very underpowered for looking at complications. Um, NICE, for their guidance, did some modelling and basically they found, uh, they suggest that the delayed prescribing was the most efficient thing to do with lots of these uh, respiratory infections. But it was based on some, some you know, assumptions based on basically our, our sore throat uh, uh, trial. Um, but, but all of these suggestions that it was the best thing or the most efficient thing to do um, were based on very limited data because of the amount of uh, the number of patients. So I'm now going to talk about the Descartes cohort which actually addresses this in some detail because it allows us to look at whether antibiotics prevent complications and reconsultations um, and in particular what's the impact of delayed prescription compared to an immediate prescription. So this is 13,000, more than 13,000 people um, huge cohort, the biggest uh, prospective cohorts uh, done to date. And the bottom line, <laughs> complications are uncommon no matter what you do, around 1%. Um, and the, com the complications are, as you see, Quincy, which is pretty rare, sinusitis, otitis media, a little bit more common, and cellulitis or impetigo, uh, which happens again uh, fa fairly rarely but will, will occur. So the big question is, does delayed prescribing prevent those? Well, if you allow for the, if you like, the propensity of GPs to, to prescribe antibiotics, which is very important to do in these observational studies, the adjusted risk ratios show that you get so a risk ratio of 0.6 for antibiotics means that there's a 40% reduction in complications. And for delayed antibiotics, there's a similar reduction. So roughly halving the complication. So basically antibiotics or delayed antibiotics will, will halve your complications or thereabouts between 40 and 50% 50 50 reduction. So there's definitely something there uh, for individuals that you're a bit concerned about who might be more likely to get a complication. Um, the other thing that it's worth noting, which was very interesting to find, was um, delayed prescribing actually reduces reconsultations more effectively, in fact, than immediate antibiotics. So uh, around 50 to 15 to 20 percent of people will come back within a month with either the same symptom or a progression of symptoms and antibiotics will reduce that by 25 percent so that's a risk ratio of 0.76 so that's about a 25 percent reduction and the delayed antibiotic will reduce it by even a little bit more so about 40 percent. In summary really what we've shown uh, from the Descartes sore throat co cohort and actually we've got very very similar data coming out now from a big study in chest infections the 3C cohort complications are uncommon um, but if you're considering an antibiotic, um, they certainly will reduce complications and, and re-consultations. Uh, re-consultations even better with uh, delayed uh, prescription. So if you're considering an antibiotic, I would consider a delayed prescription uh, for most of the time you're considering an antibiotic. Prevents complications, reduces re-consultations, and it's at least as effective as immediate antibiotics and will lower your antibiotic use. Okay, so um, there is a place for it doesn't need to be all the time. What are the concerns that people commonly have about uh, using it? Well, the first, I think the commonest concern is if I, you know, if I use this, people are just going to go out and use it. Well, that's true. Some people will. But if you do delayed prescription properly, I think all the trials will show that if you give clear advice, use the six R's, um, there will be relatively low antibiotic use. Um, the second common concern is, is this giving mis mixed messages? Um, and again, I think there is that capacity to give mixed messages. If you say, ah, oh, well, I just, I'm not sure, I'd, I'd, uh, I maybe I'd, I'd take this in a few days. Clearly that's giving a mis mixed message. But the whole point about this is to say, you do not need antibiotics now. And certainly um, if you use the six R's, there's no evidence that you're giving mixed messages at all. The belief in antibiotics is very similar compared, comparing no or um, a delayed prescription. So the message is you don't need antibiotics now 
and you're going to get side effects if you do. Very, very occasionally, people will need to use the antibiotic, but I would only use the antibiotic in the following situation. So it's, it's doing it properly, the six R's. Um, the third thing is, the third common concern is it's not as effective as no offer of a prescription. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, you will get slightly higher rates of antibiotic use, but if, if it's done properly, the rates of antibiotic use will be in the mid to low 30%, which is fine. Um, having said that, I don't think most people need a delayed prescription. I would keep it for the ones where you're a little bit worried. Certainly people that you're really not worried about at all, I would do an, uh, no prescription. If you use it compared to using an immediate antibiotic, it will reduce the number of people who come back to see you by about a third. So it'll save you time. Fourthly, people are worried about medical legal consequences. If I, if I use this and somebody has a complication, am I going to get into trouble? Well, we now know from two big cohorts that the complication rate uh, is reduced by both immediate and a delayed antibiotic. So, so that, that data is out there now and can, will, can be referred to if this ever came up. Complications will occur. They still occur when you have immediate antibiotics. They will occur if you have delayed antibiotics, but they're about the same in both. Um, they will occur more if you have no antibiotics. So um, that's why the idea of targeting uh, antibiotics uh, flexibly um, is, is sensible. Um, lastly, will it take so much more time? I think, I think the, f the first time you use a delayed prescription and for a while you're getting used to, to the, the sensible things you have to say, yeah, it will take a bit more time. But um, most of those six R's you have to do anyway. The bit about delayed prescription is explaining the natural history and explaining clearly when they should use it. So it is a little bit extra, but, but most of us say the six R's you, you're going to be doing anyway. Um, so that's common concerns. And what next? How can you actually do this practically? Well, I think this is rather nice. Uh, Target have produced a rather nice patient information leaflet that is um, pretty much will help you do everything you need to do. So all the sections can be personalized and added to by the GP. Uh, you've got the information about natural history there, information about safety netting, so you don't have to go through it all, you can just point to it, and um, information about a backup prescription and how to use it, and information about antibiotics resistance. So what I quite like doing when I've got these, um, uh, either a booklet or something like this, is to go through it and point to the patient when you're talking about the different things so you feel like you're signposting them to the different bits of the leaflet. They take the leaflet home, you've given them concrete advice, a rather nice thing to do. Um, so, what next? Well, if you haven't tried it, I'd give it a go. Patients like it, if you do it properly, uh, uh, you're gonna get quicker and you will reduce antibiotic use. But to do it properly, you need to remember the six R's, which I won't go through again. <laughs> um, I would aim personally to keep it for the 30 odd percent where you're a little bit unsure. So 5% of people are pretty unwell, you're pretty worried about them, you're going to want to give antibiotics. Um, 40 to 50% hopefully you're not really very worried about and certainly I would do a new prescription and just uh, proper safety netting. Um, but there may be the group that you're a bit unsure about, 30 to 40% maybe. Um, think about targeting those. I would do an audit to see how often you're using it, how often you're using the different strategies. Um, but if you use delayed prescription properly, it will save you time for the patients you use it because you'll reduce reconsultations. You'll have fewer complications than no prescription. Um, so I think it has a place, a very useful place. And that is where I'm going to end. Thank you. Welcome back. I hope the presentation sparked questions in your mind for Professor Little and Dr. Grainier about backup antibiotic prescribing. Again, like last week, if you want the Q&A in full screen, click on the icon in the bottom right corner. Please do keep those challenging questions coming. So, um, I thought that was really interesting, Paul. You covered a lot of ground on um, backup prescriptions. But I wondered, Steve, um, in your daily practice, can you talk us through how you use backup um, delayed antibiotics? 
Yes, Akira, we do use backup prescriptions in our uh, practice, and we use them for patients who have moderate symptoms where you're not wanting to take an immediate uh, antibiotic prescribing option, uh, or for those patients who really want antibiotics in spite of you explaining that antibiotics are not going to be useful on this occasion. So I think the, the six R's that, that Paul's already referred to are, are, are really important when, you, when you're giving that message and communicating that effectively to patients. So you're reassuring them um, that you've examined them thoroughly and on the basis of what you've found, antibiotics are not going to make any difference on this occasion. They're not needed now. Um, reasons not to use antibiotics are that you might become unwell, you might get diarrhea, a rash, um, and uh, and they, they are probably not going to make any difference. And then giving a realistic time scale about how long you expect their, their illness to go on for. So I'm giving you a prescription here um, for your cough, for example. Uh, don't expect, uh, you know, I don't expect it to improve necessarily over the next, well, if it hasn't improved over the next seven days, then there's an antibiotic that you can use, or if you feel your symptoms are getting uh, worse, uh, then you've got a treatment option. But again, reinforcing that you don't feel that antibiotics are needed uh, right now. Uh, and then giving good rescue advice. So this is the safety netting, uh, what to look out for, um, what should you do if your symptoms are getting worse, and the uh, target treat your infection leaflet is a good resource to use to save a bit of time in doing that. Okay, so um, Paul, a recent national survey showed that only a fifth of the general public knew, understood what a backup antibiotic was, and only a third thought it was a good idea. So how do you think we can get over this scepticism of the general public around backup prescriptions? Yeah, I think probably the main issue there is that most people haven't been exposed to this. Um, uh, what we found in our studies is that, that uh, people, uh, when, when the, the, the delayed uh, approach is used well, uh, as Steve said, with the sort of the six R's, um, people are actually very happy with that. So long as it's been well explained to them, uh, the rationale, when they should use it, uh, people actually find it uh, very helpful and they're less likely to come back, not only for that infection, but for future infections. So I think if you've had it done well, and there's really no reason why you shouldn't do, do this well, it's, it's part of, if you like, the six R's are mostly part of good practice anyway. Uh, people will find it, well nearly nearly everybody, you can't satisfy everybody, but nearly everybody will find it a, a helpful and uh, empowering thing to do. Okay, so Steve, um, I've got a question from uh, Leah. She says, um, how does delayed backup prescribing fit in with electronic scripts? So it, it's no different from doing it with an ordinary prescription. Uh, there, there are two options. You can either uh, generate the prescription and print it out rather than sending it electronically to the chemist. Uh, or you can uh, send a prescription electronically. It is possible to send a message to the pharmacist as well, uh, explaining that this is a backup prescription. Um, so uh, b both ways work. You can ha choose the option to, to, to post-date the prescription. Uh, in fact, most of the time now I just prescribe a, a dear prescription for that day. Uh, the other option is some, some practices choose to get the patient to come back uh, and pick up a prescription uh, from reception at a later date. So uh, again, even with electronic prescriber, you can print the prescription out and just send it to reception. So does that make any difference um, for dispensing practices? So somebody was saying, you know, what, what, you know, we're a dispensing practice. How can, yeah. we, how can we do this? I don't think it makes any difference to a dispensing practice. Um, any tips? Uh, well, I, I guess, um, as, as Paul has discussed in, the, in his presentation, that, that reducing prescribing, re reducing antibiotic prescribing reduces future consultations. So, uh, so effectively, in the longer term, uh, we reduce our workload by reducing prescribing. So it's still uh, an important thing to, to, to do. And, uh, and again, the, the patients can come back to the practice reception uh, and, and take the prescription to, the, to, to their, if it's an in-house pharmacy, uh, I think it's still possible to do it that way without. Yeah. Okay, there's been a few questions about pay more complex patients. So let's start with um, uh, Paul. Would you still use backup delayed prescribing in patients, um, elderly patients with acute cough? Yeah, I think, I think uh, there's elderly patients and there's elderly patients. So obviously somebody who's very, very sick, you're worried about, they've got lots of complex comorbidities, I wouldn't worry about those individuals having antibiotics if you're worried about them. 
Um, we know that actually the fit elderly, even if there are some co comorbidities, if they're not too unwell, they will do fine with a delayed prescription. Um, so I think it, it depends on common sense and, and, and good clinical management. So very unwell elderly patients, uh, that's a different uh, matter. But um, relatively fit elderly, and we've got a lot of relatively fit elderly, um, I wouldn't worry too much. So what about patients with diabetes, chronic kidney problems, chronic kidney disease, immunocompromised patients? I mean, they're a bit more tricky, maybe. Yeah, sure. So, um, and I think, um, again, if, if, if they seem to be doing okay with their infections, fine. But those, that's exactly the group where I'd be a little bit more worried. Um, and so if I was using a delayed prescription, if I wasn't that worried, but I was using a delayed prescription, I might shorten the delay and make it very clear that, that any worsening of symptoms, I'd expect them to use their antibiotic. Um, so I would, I would, you have to negotiate these things and you have to use your clinical judgment as to the, the, exactly the advice you give. But there's no reason why you shouldn't use it in a lot of elderly patients, just not the very sick ones. So Steve, got a bit of a challenge for you. Um, somebody's saying, are you giving all these delayed antibiotics means that um, they can't reconsult with you, so the patient goes back to the walk-in centre um, or A and E, um, and they lose trust in you and um, you know get get medication elsewhere. You know what do you think? Hmm. So I, I guess that there is a small chance of that happening. I think in reality it doesn't happen very often. I think the the, the the more widespread this message is around not using antibiotics, I think the, the more of us will, uh, the, the more clinicians will, will follow the same, uh, the, the same script, I guess, and, and not prescribe antibiotics. So I think that's a, a very important thing, that we're all giving the same messages to patients. Again, that, that might happen occasionally, and I think the safety netting bit is important. You know, you're not saying to someone, I, um, I, you, you definitely don't need, what you're saying is, I, you don't need antibiotics now, uh, and you're giving that advice about what to do if their symptoms are not resolving in the given time scale or if their symptoms become worse. And I think if you explain that carefully to patients and, and you get their agreement around that, then patients are generally quite happy, uh, even if they do have to, they, they do receive treatment later. Okay, so um, there's two interesting questions that come in, one from Anne and um, one from Sarah. So um, they're both interlinked. So have you done any qualitative work to determine what factors prompt people to pick up the backup delayed prescription? And is there any, and connected with that, is there any evidence that patients in area of deprivation, lower education are more likely to take their delayed antibiotic, so... Um, so the, the first question, no, that's a really interesting question and that is something that we will want to explore both with the quantitative data we have from the, the studies um, uh, but also qualitatively talking with, with patients. We do know that when we've talked with patients in the studies we've done so far that people are actually very happy with the approach um, so long as it's done, done properly. Um, as I say, it's not that complicated, it's just sort of good practice really. Um, so I think, uh, I think that's uh, that's definitely something we'll want to be exploring in the future. Um, what was the second question again? Um, is there evidence that patients in area of de high deprivation or lower education are more likely to pick up their yes. prescription? That's an interesting one. Um, the, the very first trial we did in sore throat uh, and actually in ear infections, they're both done in the most one of the most deprived areas of Southampton. Um, and uh, the, we had low levels of people using their antibiotics. So. Um, I, think, I think there's really no evidence that deprivation makes a, a, a big difference there. Um, you would have thought that you know, with um, uh, more affluent, more educated uh, folk that it might go down better, but I think it's, it's fine. It's, it comes back to this issue of explaining properly, explaining clearly, and deprivation per se I, I think isn't a barrier. Okay. So Paul, um, you said early on in your presentation that immediate antibiotics reduce symptoms in otitis media compared to delayed by half to one, just half to one day. Yeah. Did the study include all patients with otitis media or did it exclude more severe cases? So I, I suppose what I'm trying to get at is in everyday use would back up prescriptions give even less, you know, more benefit compared to immediate antibiotics? Yeah, okay, so uh, yeah, the trial, we, we looked at the representativeness of the patients coming into that trial, of the children coming into that trial, and they certainly were uh, very representative. Um, clearly, the very, very sickest children um, would not get into that trial or any trial. Um, 
But it's true, if you use a delayed prescription in a milder group of uh, children, then you'll get even less benefit uh, than we showed from, uh, from antibiotics. Okay, so those, that third slide you showed about the benefit of antibiotics was really important because although the trials show a significant benefit, a, a significant benefit, the amount, whether it's clinically relevant, it's very yeah. short, you know, in hours. So do you yeah. think we should be explaining this actual benefit much more clearly to patients? Yeah, well, I, I, I normally do. I say, you know, you, you might have, uh, uh, you might believe that antibiotics would be helpful here. And I normally say, yeah, they can help a little bit. They can make the difference of between half a day and a day normally. And I'd have to treat 10 people like you or more than that for one person to benefit. So the amount of benefit is small. So it's one of the reasons not to use antibiotics because you not only get a small benefit, but you get the side effects and you get uh, reduced immunity from various reasons, both because you, you uh, polish off the good bugs in your throat, if you like, and you also reduce your antibody rise so that actually the next time you see a, an organism, A, you're more likely to get it, and B, you're less likely to be able to throw it off more quickly. So these number of hours, it might be something we could add to the treat your infection leaflet, the yeah. actual benefits. So yeah, we'll idea. think about that. Okay. Good idea. Um, Steve. What about recurrent infections? Do you use, maybe we can have a bit of a discussion about that. What do you think? Say for recurrent tonsillitis, for example. Yes. Yeah, I mean, would I think you still? Was, yeah, I think that was one of the ones that we were, we were talking about earlier, what we do with patients who have uh, persistent recurrent tonsillitis, who've got scarred tonsils, who maybe feel ill, and, and we, uh, you feel quite ill when, whenever they get it. And, and again, that, that's a relatively small minority of patients uh, presenting with tonsillitis. So I think the view is that, that that is a specific group. It might be appropriate to treat them uh, you know, immediately if their symptoms are, are severe. But again, you can use the fever pain tool to decide which, how to target the treatment uh, in each case. And those with, with, four, uh, uh, with a score of four uh, or with severe symptoms, an immediate antibiotic pres prescription is, is appropriate. But delayed antibiotic is also something you might want to consider. And again, it's discussing you know, the benefits uh, and, and the risks, of uh, the downsides with antibiotics. And as, as Paul has said as well, you know, could the recurrent use of antibiotics even increase the chance of this just coming back repeatedly? Um, because the immune system isn't, you know, isn't, isn't adapting appropriately to the infection. So um, this brings us ni nicely onto Hanisha's question. So you've got these patients with their backup antibiotics at home. What is the risk they become unwell again and choose not to go back to the GP but just use their antibiotics they've got at home? Well, do you know whether that might happened? have more information on that than I do. I mean, anecdotally, certainly we do come across patients quite often who have a supply of antibiotics either from themselves or someone else in the family, uh, and that and that, that is a is a small risk. But but we know that by by you know following the the the, the advice around just in case antibiotics or deferred antibiotics, we are reducing the amount of antibiotic we're prescribing overall. So on balance, it still seems like the most pragmatic strategy to use. And yes, some patients will take them inappropriately, uh, but the more frequently, the more often we communicate that message and we're all saying the same things, I think hopefully we'll stop, start to break that cycle. So um, another participant said, is there a role for CRP combined with delayed antibiotics, Paul? What do you think? Uh, there, is, there is a role, and so CRP can help you uh, when you're thinking, could this patient possibly have pneumonia or not? Um, and and I have recommended it in that situation. I, I personally don't find CRP that helpful, but if you're going to use it, if you're unsure about it, and then a low value for CRP then could be helpful in you saying either no antibiotic or a delayed antibiotic, sure. Um, the reason I'd, I didn't use it in my practice, don't, wouldn't recommend it necessarily routinely, is because um, uh, you don't need to use it in order to be able to negotiate uh, um, low antibiotic prescribing. And um, what we're talking about really is, are you worried about there being a pneumonia? Now, barn door pneumonias are clinically relatively obvious. Um, so the question is, uh, for somebody who's perhaps got a little bit of, of uh, consolidation that isn't very obvious clinically, and most of those will settle anyway. Um, so I have no great problem about people using CRP if they want to. The other minor thing in practice is obviously it takes time. You've got to do the test. Um, it's not that expensive. They're actually rather cheap. Um, but then you've got to review them afterwards and negotiate. So it, it lengthens the whole process. So I, I'm not a personally a great fan, but I think there is a place for it.
So I can come in there because we use CRP a, a little in our practice and we practice 17, 17 and a half thousand patients and we, over a year, I think it, we had about a thousand patients presenting with respiratory tract infections um, and uh, we did CRP 110 times uh, over the year. So it seems as though we're selecting out, that, sorry, that's with, with cough uh, um, and so, and I, I used it probably, you know, 10 times or so over the year, once a month. And, and it's that intermediate group of patients, those that you, you, you may be not sure, they, they perhaps more unwell. You, there's something about their presentation that you're not quite happy with, they're not getting better perhaps, or they're patients who particularly want an antibiotic and, you, and it's one of the strategies you might use. I think the delayed antibiotic is, 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 is probably quicker uh, and maybe more effective, but it, it is a tool that can be helpful. It can also break the cycle of patients wanting to, uh, you know, you demonstrate to them actually that, that there's no sign of, of an infection that needs antibiotics. On the other hand, we could over-medicalize their consulting, you know, patients come back to have that test, can I have that test again because I had it last time. So you've obviously yeah. done some audit yeah. of your practice. So thinking about audits, if we wanted practices to do audits around delayed prescribing, if we were, if somebody was going to do an audit around hepatitis media, for example, how many people do you think, what percentage would we be expecting to give immediate and what percentage to be giving delayed? What should people be aiming for? Tricky I, question there. I, I, think, I think you can make a, a general rule. My, my sort of general rule is that I don't think, I think most people don't need an antibiotic at all. So if you like, you know, 50%, let's say, uh, where you're not particularly worried about them, um, they're, they're walking wounded. Um, and then there'll be the, 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 the children in this case at the top end of the spectrum who are really very unwell and you're really quite worried about them and you'll probably be giving those an immediate antibiotic. And the remaining sort of 20, 30 percent or thereabouts, um, I'd try, be trying to negotiate for most of those a delayed prescription. Um, but actually a delayed prescription for, it, as long as it's explained properly for, for all children with otitis media is, is perfectly fine and you'll get a relatively low rate of use of antibiotics if you do it in, in a, with the six R's in a similar way. So I wouldn't worry about using delayed prescription more, it's just that you do need to use it properly. And you said it was safe to wait 72 hours for a Titus Media. How, is that from yes. the time of presentation or the start of illness? Um, generally you're talking about the start of illness if it is um, severe. So, so most, mostly, you know, uh, parents come in, they've had a night of no sleep themselves and the child. Um, the child's been really w very unwell and they're desperate for some sleep for themselves and their child. So I would normally say, on average, I try and wait another two days, but bear in mind that the next 24 hours, whatever we do, antibiotics or not, are really not gonna make much difference because the pain will be rapidly settling in that time. We know that. And so it's really a, a temporizing. Um, so you want you know, decent levels of paracetamol being used. Um, we know that most people don't use paracetamol uh, regularly or in full doses. Um, so you're just trying to get over the first 24 hours after they see you and after that uh, symptoms will be a lot milder, even in those who still have symptoms, which will be, you know, about 50% will still have symptoms, but it'll be getting much less. So I'm going to give you two very, very quick questions because we're coming to the end. So, and we need to cover two very quick things. The first thing is, somebody's asked about sinusitis. What about the management of this condition? How can we choose who to treat immediately, delayed or no? Can you answer that in 30 seconds? Okay. It's and then I'm going to follow up one on conjunctivitis. <laughs> it's a miserable condition. Uh, we, there hasn't been a trial of delayed prescribing in sinusitis, but the, the people who would most benefit from antibiotics, they don't benefit hugely, are those where you look in their nose and you actually see pus. So they usually have been talking about lots of green snot and you can see pus there. Um, there's some other features in the history, but anyway, that's... Uh, but you need to treat about eight of those for one to benefit and the average patient with sinusitis that we see you have to treat more than 10 for one to benefit so and when you say to benefit that benefit we're talking about i've written it down here somewhere about a day or so a day there, yes 24 hours something yeah. like that it is it is surprising how little benefit there is um, so it's really again temporizing and trying to help people through the... the and you the mentioned system. conjunctivitis, so we'll finish on that one. So what about conjunctivitis? How should we assess these patients, decide who gets immediate or backup? Well, there's, again, for the patients we see in general practice, um, the Oxford group did a trial comparing antibiotics with, if you like, a, a saline, um, uh, saline drops, and there was really no difference at all. Um, so 
I would feel a bit worried if somebody comes in with extremely red eyes and, and pus and stuff uh, not to provide an antibiotic, but most other people either, either just uh, some eye drops or a, a delayed antibiotic, a antibiotic eye drop prescription. Um, and again, most people were very happy with that in our trial of delayed antibiotics. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Um, we didn't actually manage to get all the questions answered because there were so many, but um, that's the end of our fourth webinar. And many thanks for participating. And I hope you all um, took part in Antibiotic Awareness uh, Week last week. So I do hope that sharing how we used backup prescribing has clarified all your issues. Um, don't forget to explore all the materials on the Target webinar website. You can, there you can replay the presentation and you'll also find papers covering the evidence and links to the Target Treat Your Infection leaflet, which can facilitate backup prescribing. So in the next day or so, you'll soon be receiving an email asking you to reflect on how you make take forward actions suggested in the webinar and giving us some feedback. Please do complete this if possible, as it will help us all to improve. So see you next week for webinar five, when we'll be discussing the diagnosis and management of urinary tract infections with Professor Chris Butler and Mandy Wooten from Cardiff University. Until then, goodbye from me, Paul and Steve. Goodbye.